All right, so it's recording now. So we're going to get started. We'll start with prayer and we'll get going. No, no one's on yet. No one's there. So I don't know. It's not. It's only 1027. So like they're probably thinking it's regular 1030 or something. I don't know. But it's all right. When they come on, we won't, I won't know. I'll just, I'll just, on the break, we'll check. But, so let's just start and pray. So, Father, thank you again for the day we have uh, yesterday, and thank you for this day today and just opportunity this whole weekend just to continue to remind ourselves of your presence in our lives and all the more as we do not want to forsake this assembling of ourselves together as we see your day approaching. And so we thank you so much for giving us this time, giving us the ability to physically be together. Thank you for the times we're always together in spirit with you and with each other, and we thank you so much for your support and for your love as our Father, our always constant caregiving, good and great and chief shepherd. And we thank you that you always guard our lives and guide us also and knit us together. Help us continue to see uh, things in your word and your truth about you and how you want us to understand what you have written. And help us to be prepared not only in mind and heart and spirit, but also to live this out in a way that is pleasing to you, seeking you to just always be again, uh, looking to see you be so proud of us as your children. And we want to just make you proud and, and, and see the the good smile on your face and we could see in our own self that sense that we've given all of our best we've given it our all not just to get to know you trust everything you say but also fight and strive to live it out through tough times of relationships and demands of mental emotional or physical just help us to fight through help us to continue to know that we have your strength to do that with us and for us and through us so I ask us now father just be assembled in your sight we ask that you would help us teach us guide us be our pastor and our guide and our shepherd and our coming bridegroom. We ask all this in Jesus, Yeshua's name, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we have more good people today. It's awesome. Three more. So now we're at 10, right? right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight, eight, ten. Are they coming in person? Who's that? Jorge? They will probably come Sunday because he's working. Oh, I, that's what we moved here. I thought they were. Yeah, that's all right. They're probably gonna, they're, they might or might not. I don't know. He's trying to get that time off. I actually had to write a, a letter to his work, actually, <coughs> to allow them to know that he actually is actually going to a Bible study congregation and worship. And they were like, yeah, right. You know, like, no, it's true. <laughs> so, so I sent him a letterhead. And so hopefully that helps. I don't know. That was kind of this week, though. So, but they're hoping to be here. So, so we left off last time. We, we've gone through this paper. I think, Jim, you have one. Lee has one. I know. I gave one to Lee. And uh, so we're on the part where you can help out Lee. Uh, Vicki, if you can, go to the page, help him out. We're on Salvations. If you can help them to help oh, uh, the paper. The paper, um, help them with. And Nancy, too. Sorry, Nancy doesn't know what we're right either. That's right. <laughs> yeah, the paper. No you, both, no, you each have. Yeah, turn to the page. Oh, okay. No, no, no. No, we're just trying to turn to the page where we're at. <laughs> yeah, you guys don't know where we're at. We're on the south. Like page, like page nine, I think it is. You'll see at the top it says Salvation's Highlight, like page nine. It's page nine if you number. But he's on. He's already turned it to the least. So I just numbered the uh, page. Oh, oh, he went. Yeah. Just the front page is the Is that page nine, isn't it, Tracy? Yeah, it's page nine. So it's page nine. If you go front and back and count, it's page nine we're on. You'll see salvation. It's at the top highlighted. It's page five, but four pages. Oh, four. So I was wrong then. Well, it's on page five, but I numbered it. Okay. All right. Thank you. One, two, three. Oh, okay. Four pages numbered the front. You see it? It's right here. It's salvation. Oh, God. Okay, does Nancy have it? No, no, no. Count four pages over and then you're here. Keep going, two, three. We're right here on this one. Page. One more page. Did you number this? Two. We're on this one, right? Yeah. One more page. Right here. Yeah, okay. That's where we're at. We're right there. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Right there. That's what we are. Now we're all on the same page, literally. I got more jokes, so just wait for them. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The electrician had to ha had to you know had to take care of his kid for misbehaving, so now he's grounded. Okay. Anyway, so come on, that's good. <laughs> but his wife's the light of his life. Okay. Anyway, so in salvations, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna look at salvations, and we're looking. At <laughs> Uh, salvation. Here we're looking at just the, all the different verses again where this uh, comes up. So before we looked at the mystery itself, we're on part two, which is the different distinctions between how the scripture should be understood versus what churchianity would present. So this is about the word salvations. And again, I'm looking at when it's plural, not salvation in singular, but when it's plural. So I wanted to list all these for us so we can, we can see these. But before I want to start with this general context, and this is where we started up yesterday a little bit with the holothros. And here I have that from destruction holothros. So you want to, what do you, you save from, from earthly consequences, destruction, holothros, 
and, and destruction apoleia, which is the age lasting consequences, and in two blessings of inheritance and or inheritance in the kingdom of the heavens or the kingdom of the God. And that goes back to 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 9 and 10. So if you read this, and I just want to make sure you, we kind of understand that people always say, save, how you have more than one salvation and what do you save from and to? So you're saved from and to two different things, right? Save from a negative and save to a positive. So when you go to 1 Corinthians 6, and we look at this from verses uh, 9, 9 and 10, I wanted to point out things that we've, we've heard and seen people use this incorrectly, and they don't understand. They take this versing here. I remember hearing this exactly from Tennessee Temple in Chattanooga, and afterwards I was not, I was just there as a guest, and I was invited to go, and afterwards his name was Bollinger, uh, not Bollinger. Bollinger. That's not his name. I saw him just there, something with a B, something, that wasn't there. Some other name, B, B Bomber. Anyway, anyway he, afterwards this guy invited me, said, hey, hey meet the pastor guy. I'm like, uh, okay. So I didn't want to do that. I didn't like what he had to say. And so I thought I'm going to be in an uncomfortable situation. So he put me up there and he said, hey, how'd you like the message? Oh, boy. And he taught on this passage. And I said, you know, it, 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 you know I, I don't know what to say. And he goes, well, what's wrong? And I said, I don't agree with your uh, assessment that this verse you said, inheritance is the same as salvation. And uh, he said, well, everybody knows that, son. And I said, first, don't, oh. don't call me son. I don't like that. And, and secondly, I'm everybody, I'm, an, I'm a body, I'm part of the every, and I don't believe that, nor do I see that. So there's the verse, he, he goes, read it, and I said, okay, let's read it together. Do you not know that unrighteous persons shall not inherit God's kingdom? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminates, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous persons, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And he said, well, see, you can't be those ways and be saved. That's not what it says. It says inherit. It's different. And, and he just didn't want, he goes, everybody knows the same thing. Goes, no, it's not. And then he goes, we're going to have to agree to disagree. I go, I'm going to agree that you don't know what you're talking about. So, and then I just walked away. So, so yeah, and his friend didn't like that. So He didn't look up the Greek? He didn't really care because that's, he was, that's a Lordship Salvation mentality. By the way, this same congregation, he said, women, none of them could ever, ever, never, ever, never, ever wear jeans at any time. Whether you're working in the yard, whether you're outside, no, ever. What's the difference? He oh, couldn't wear jeans. You have to wear a dress all the time. You have to wear a dress all the time. You have to wear a skirt or a dress all the time. And you couldn't go to any kind of movie at all, ever. No matter what it is. If it's rated G, it doesn't matter what it is. You can't ever go to a movie. So he's, he's, like, he's old school like that. It's like, okay. But anyway, so th this verse is misinterpreted by a lot of folks to not understand. But when you point this out, that inheritance is different from salvation, then you, this is just about salvation at first. But I want to make sure people understand that this is where they, they get kind of lost in thinking, well, how can somebody be blank and be saved? Well, because they're not inheriting, that's all. So that's why I wanted to put this verse there. So the ongoing salvation is kind of tied into, ongoing salvation is tied into inheritance. They, they work together, which is why Hebrews says, you're, and if you look at Hebrews, I didn't have it in here, but if we turn to Hebrews just for a minute, and in chapter 2, he says it this way, and if, ter if, inheritance, if inheritance means salvation, here's a verse that will make them really, St stammer when you show them in Hebrews chapter 1 I said to have chapter 1 verse 14 chapter 1 verse 14 are they not all ministering spirits sent forth for service on account of those being about to inherit salvation so if inheritance means salvation that means God stutters you're about to salvation salvation that makes no sense right so obviously they're two different things they're in the same verse together and he's talking about ongoing and salvations will gain you an inheritance. That's why he says inherit a salvation. They, get, they go together. And so this is an interesting text to show somebody and say, if inheritance means salvation, then please put the word salvation where the word inheritance is and read it again. See how it makes no kind of sense. He's about to salvation, salvation. It makes no sense. That's Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Hebrews 1, 14. That's Hebrews 1, 14. I didn't write it written here, but I just wanted to point that out here. But then, and, and if Preston, he, Preston, I also want you to go Hebrews one verse fourteen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also want you then to go to Galatians five twenty one. Okay. Because I'm not speaking for everyone, but I'm sure no, people could okay. look in First Corinthians six nine and ten. There are probably words in there that some of us or all of us have participated in. So you yeah. think, well, then how do I even have a chance to inherit? But now, when you read Galatians five twenty one. So in Galatians five twenty one, envyings. Uh, and in and, and, and revelings, and things similar to these, respecting which I tell you before, even as I previously told you, that those who practice who such practice things practice such things shall not inherit, kingdom, yep, inherit God's kingdom. Yep. Right. 
And the word is practice, which is different than saying you can sin. That's no big deal. I mean, it is a big deal, but it, right. it makes you a sinner. Right. But to continue to go into sin willingly, which is what Hebrews talks about, chapter 10, he who willingly, voluntarily continues to sin. That's what you're talking about. So Hebrews 1.14, Galatians 5.21, and Hebrews again in 10, what's it, 25 to 27, talks about that issue of willfully sinning versus just sin. We're all going to sin, but if you continue to engage in it, like, oh, no big deal, God's going to forgive me. No, that is a big deal. Now you're doing something that's against God's rule. That's not. You're voluntarily trying to abuse God's grace. Falling into sin is not the same thing as living in sin. What's yeah? The kingdom what, inherit. What's that? This, these, what this is reflecting is the sins go into the day eight committed. And five. Where are you at? Where, why, why would you say that? Oh, it says those that practice oh. such things shall well, not inherit God's the ki- kingdom. So remember, God. So remember. So thing. so remember. No, no. So remember God's kingdom. So let me draw on the board to remind you. So when you see this, so I just want to make sure you understand this. So you have this is God's God's kingdom, which is equal to kingdom. Or I should say, yeah, it's the like kingdom everything. of God. And then on the earth, there's an earthly sphere of this kingdom. If you were this, there's an earthly sphere, yeah. earthly realm, I want to call it. It's, and that, and that's going to be the kingdom of the God. That's right. And then over here is the heavenly side of it, and that's and that's the heavenly realm. And this is the kingdom of the heavens. So. This because it says this. This is the whole thing. Okay. See, so that's the whole thing. Just so you don't get tripped up by but that. Wouldn't that still apply though? What I just said. Well, I mean, well, te- 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 technically, it applies to the whole thing. So it's it, yeah, it's, it's day seven in it. It's just not restrictive to either one. That's all I'm saying. Okay. It's not restrictive to either one. It, it encompasses everything. But that means what that means though. Let's make sure you're clear. On here, you and you inherit. or enter, right? That's what you do here. There's only two choices here. There's this one, and there's this one. That, that's it, there's no there's no other choice. That's it, you inherit or you enter, like that's it. The earth. The earth, earthly realm. On the heavenly realm, you do the same thing, but this is this is what you have. The earthly realm, you do this, the heavenly realm do the same thing, but at first, you can only enter. And you have to await to inherit. So that's a different thing. So this is kind of like that whole thing. Yesterday we had a conversation about the whole prodigal son. You have to wait for your inheritance over here. Be the faithful son. <laughs> and here you want you get it now right away. Well, because even though that's a different, I'm not saying they're bad, worse or pe- lesser people. I'm just saying this is an this is because they have a hundredfold fruit. They have a hundredfold fruit, and less was expected of them. Remember, too much is given, much is required continually. That's why we have to enter because continually more is required of us. Not just here but later, and you have to wait to inherit. They had less required of them, they get their inheritance right away. They got a hundredfold, they get inheritance. And once you get inheritance, you don't ever lose it. There's no take backs. So God gives it to you, you're set, you're done. No sin can ever touch you, you're done. Which is what you want, right? So on earth, they're inheriting, and that's of the hundredfold. And then over here, we enter in as 100, 60, or 30, and we have to wait to inherit, and that's where day eight comes in, if that makes sense. You with me? Sorry, did I write that? Do you see it okay? Did I write it too inher- coherently? <laughs> so I wrote kind of backwards on my, I'm not a good teacher like Tracy would do that probably really like without even thinking about it, don't you? Do you use chalk or do you use dry erase? You are dry erase. <laughs> chalkboard once. <laughs> Very early. Do you write like that often, by the way? Do you do that often? Do you write like, you know, freely like that looking? All Can you do time. it? Yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> and you probably do cursive too, don't you? Yeah, I bet you did. For those who don't know, Trace is an English teacher, right? So I say English or literature. Is a or, language. Thank you, okay. And it's a second language. Okay. Just like people who people who are Bible teachers today, the truth is a second language. <laughs> yeah, it's a lost language. So now so now I just want to put a little blurb on here about the next part of this passage, this part of the paper. We said Ephesians two eight nine. He says you have been saved. And you don't have to turn it. That's what it says. It says, have been saved, past tense. And in 1 Corinthians 1.18, you're being saved. In 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, we saw this before. Spirit, we saw the previous, um, yesterday's talk, spirit being saved. James 1.21, we saw yesterday as well. Able to save your soul. And then 1 Peter 1.9, salvation 
soul salvation, the end of the faith. That's what it says in the language of the Bible. So I would just use those couplings and say, let's have a conversation about this to somebody who thinks there's not but just one salvation or that's all that matters. Then please just look at these verses and help me explain it. Here's what they're going to say to you. Okay, you have been saved and the ongoing being saved is sanctification. I hear that all the time, right? Brother Lee, I'm sure you hear that a lot, right? The ongoing salvation, or in 1 Corinthians 1.18, being saved, all that means is you're constantly being saved by washing yourself in the blood of Jesus. Uh, uh, okay. So I say, so let me get this straight. So you want me to believe that the living word of God, his name is the Logos, is just arbitrary with words. I just want to make sure we're clear on this. So it, why would he not be succinctly exact when he said every jot and tittle matters to him? Why would he just be saying that on this side? Every word in the mouth of God you would hear to. Not one John Tedder will fade. But over here he says, salvation, sanctification, tomato, tomato, doesn't matter. Why, why would he do that? Why would he say blueberry, raspberry, they're both berries. What's it matter? Are you serious right now? Because they're two different words. I mean, it just it makes no sense. And they go, well, salvation is a sanctification process is part of salvation. I, I understand. But that's not what he said. He said you're ongoingly being saved. So, so in 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says being saved in the constant, ongoing tense. And then, of course, you don't want people that they don't have to say to that. And then you also end up with 1 Peter 1.9, which is your right hook to them and say, okay, when you first said yesterday, you first started my faith when I believed in Jesus. How does it now end when it says, you're saying my soul was saved when I believed in him, but yet it says that's the end of my faith. That doesn't make any sense. And then there's the verse in Hebrews about soul salvation, too. Yeah, which At one you... End, which which Hebrews 13. Which one are you speaking of? Oh, you mean like the Hebrews t about the, the preservation of life, that one, the Hebrews 10? Well, I mean, it, it has to, I didn't, don't have it written down here in front of me, but it's at the end of Hebrews. So. Okay, I'm not sure which. I know in, in chapter 10 of Hebrews, he talks about the preservation of life at the end of the chapter 10. Is it that one about the, where he says, but we are not those shrinking back to destruction, but of faith in order to the preservation or saving of the soul? No, I think that's it. That's it, yeah. Preservation. It says preservation of life. That's Hebrews 10, 39. Oh, okay, it was 10. You're 30. thinking of that one? That's what I thought you were thinking of, yeah. Yep. And that's what hits Hebrews 10, 39, which comes on the cusp. I just had this conversation, apparently, with other people <laughs> on Tuesday, and, and the guy, when he read uh, back to verse uh, 20, this is not a joke. He actually said this to me, and I couldn't take it. I, I just, being quiet, and I said, no, and I spoke louder. No, and it was because he, he read verse 29, verse 28 and 29 about the law of Moses, who violated, they died without mercy, Hebrews 10 we're in right now, Hebrews 10, 28. The law of Moses, if you violate, you die without mercy by two of your witnesses. Then in Hebrews 10, 29, he said, how much worse punishment, which is more severe is the word there, do you think will he deserve having trampled on the Son of God and esteemed as a common thing, the blood of the covenant, which he was been sanctified and insulted the spirit of favor? Then the guy who led the group said, that's not written to us. That's written to Jewish people because their sanctification process is, as a priest, they would sanctify themselves. And I go, are you insane? I said, no. I said, you just, every time you see something that's confrontational or hits you right in the mouth, mm -hmm. smacks you in the mouth, you all of a sudden want to change it. It's not talking to me. To face up to what God's telling you. And he goes, well, it's not. I go, just stop. Just stop. Stop. So I went, I said, can we just read for a second? Go to verse 10 of Hebrews chapter 10. So I did to him on Tuesday. I said, look at verse 10. Which, by which will we, once you go ahead and once you go a little bit more down and read down to verse, uh, nine, uh, verse 19, having therefore brethren, and then you go again, over here into verse uh, 22, we, and then all of a sudden he says again in verse 26, if we, but all of a sudden, mysteriously, I'm supposed to think, he's not talking to me anymore. How does that make sense? The audience is clearly we, us. And he, he, he shut up. He didn't know what to say. Yeah, he goes, we and, then, and then he says, this is really going back to the Jewish people. It's written to Jewish people. It's the Jewish people. It's the Jewish people. It's the Jewish people. It's what call Hebrews. And it's Jewish. And I go, oh, oh you, mean, you mean like Hebrews 4, 12, and 13, where, where it says in the book itself that you're saying is only written to Jewish people that don't know Jesus, when it talks about the word of God being alive, and it says in verse 13, this word is written to us? You mean that, that verse? And he goes, I don't, I don't know what to say. Then I don't do this, just less of this. Because <laughs> you're not talking truth. So he didn't say anything after that, but that's why I went back to that, and they, that was it. That shut him up because he kept going back to what you're saying. Oh, the Jewish people aren't Jew. It's a Hebrew thing. And the whole book I, is written to us. And he didn't even see that. And they, I just don't even understand it. I, it flabbergasts me. But anyway, to, to get you off point. So I go back to now in Matthew 10, as we're on now, they're looking back to now the actual verses where you see this salvation in plural. We start off with Matthew chapter 10. And I wrote this out for you, how it would appear in the Greek in chapter 10, verse 22, and then also chapter 24, verse 13. He says, he who continually patient endures 
or that means bears up under, remains resilient to the end, will be saved in multiple ways. That's a work. That's a work. That's not grace through faith. So how do you have a multiple salvation through a work that's being done? And you can see that again in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, and then chapter 24, verse 13. This is not clearly salvation by grace through faith, but it's clearly a salvation in the plural. So if you look there, we'll see it. So let's go there. I know, where, where are you, Mike? Did I make an error again? No, 1022. <laughs> Ten, let me see. Let me see it. Let me, let me go there. 1022. Did I make a mistake? Let me see. No, it's right. so, it's not patient endures, so the end. Oh, we'll be saved. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll be saved. And on, it's ongoing <laughs> salvation. That's, a, that's the ongoing so salvation in the plural. That's Matthew 10, 22. Then I put Matthew 24, 13 in there as well. And Matthew 24, 13 is why I put that in there to show as well. If we turn to that one. And that's the one where he says, watch. Oh, what's it? 20, that's 25. 24, 13. I'm one chapter, two. But he who impatiently endures to the end will be saved. Again, it's in the plural. So he says the same thing twice in Matthew, using salvation in plural both times. And that's where you can get, this is just, I'm showing you verses you can take people to where salvation is in the plural. So you can see that. Then, in, and then you can see, and then in chapter 18, verse 11, the Son of Man came to save in multiple ways that which is lost, or Apollos, destroyed, uh, those of covenant and those in testament who are not adhering <coughs> to God's word. So he came to save in multiple ways those which were lost, meaning, again, save you to either in Christ and beyond, or just in Christ. It just depends on your your collaboration with him. But in 2 Peter 3, 9, I quoted that as well to kind of remind us. That's why he says that he's willing that none should perish. And that's what people take out of context. They think that, oh, God, God's not going to have anybody in the whole world want to die without Jesus. But that whole phrasing about the Lord of the promise is not slow. This is 2 Peter 3, 9, regarding he's patient, he's writing slowness, but he's patient toward us, not wishing anyone should perish, but come to reformation or repentance. That's in combination with he wants you to have an ongoing salvation experience. He doesn't want you just to be saved past tense. He wants you to be saved ongoing tense, going back to 1 Corinthians 1, 18. He wants you to patiently endure to the end. He wants you to have the best of what he has for you. That's what he means. And I always explain it to people that are agricultural folks. I go, hey, let me ask you this question. If I'm a farmer and I plan to I plant a crop of corn or a crop of beans. Do I not say to myself, I hope that none of this crop perishes, man. Don't I say that? Well, yeah. But I, do I say that? Do I say that? In, my, in my mind, don't lie. In my mind, as a farmer, I may have 100 acres, 1,000 acres, 80 acres, 10 acres, whatever I, I'm praying to God, please, God, let all my crop come to fruition. Let me have the fullest harvest. When I'm saying that, do I honestly, don't lie, do I honestly think about everybody in the entire county, my entire neighborhood, my entire state? Am I thinking about that? No. I'm asking about my crop. <laughs> so, so when God said, well, under he's talking about his own crop, his own people. I mean, it's not hard to understand when you break it. I told an agriculture person in Illinois, a family member, and right away he goes, well, doggone, that makes sense. Because you know it's true. Because you know it's true. It resonates with the tr When you see it, when how God sees it, then all of a sudden it resonates. When the preachers behind the pulpit keep telling you the wrong way, it gets you to that whole cognitive dissidence thing, and you get all confused. Then you see it from God's point of view. He's saying, why would I not want to have anybody perish who's my kid? Of course I don't want you all to perish. Why would I want you to have that? But unfortunately, I've ordained these things that you can be responsible for your lack of collaboration. So even though I ordained it, you can see that you, it's your choices. We talked about that yesterday. By the way, Brother Lee, you missed, you'll love this, but yesterday, I know you a uh, uh, sovereignty guy like me back in the day, way before. <laughs> so, but there's a, I was talking about the neurology study where they showed that actually they tested people, put a choice in front of them of like apple, banana, right? Or whatever, it's Coke, soda, water, you know, water and whatever. And so then when they made the choices, before the choices was made, they saw, saw neurologically the blood rushing already to the brain to, before they even made a choice, showing that their brain was already stimulated to make the choice without any knowledge they, they had that going on. There was a biological change within them that already happened prior to them making their outward choice, showing there's no such thing as free will. They made a choice on the basis of their biological makeup already predetermined them to lean that way. Like, what? But they don't know what caused that. We know what caused that. It's called G-O-D. <laughs> that's what caused that. There's a, there's a, there's a, that's, that's, that's a God problem. There's a portion of your brain that actually processes information. Like you see everything. Yeah. But there's a portion of your brain that only selects what you are interested in. It's very interesting. Yeah. You don't have any cognizance of it at all. Yeah. That's what, and you see a whole room, but only the things that you're interested in is allowed into your cognition. Yeah. And think about that. And people say, why? And, and they say things like, why is this important to know about sovereignty and free will? Because... The, the scientific atheist community believes that there's no such thing as free will. Right. 
but they know what I just said is true. They go they on the science true. facts. It's true. So when you're a person who believes in Jesus and you speak this to them, they're like, oh, you're not stupid. No, we're not. Exactly. No, we're not. We, we do agree. You're just calling it particles of the Big Bang. We're calling it God. Your different premise, same result. Yeah. They're, having, <laughs> so they're, they're having a problem now with this yeah. telescope because yeah. this is showing that there is no real... No life out there? No, there is, no. All, all the stars have planets. And the order of, you know, the further back you go into oh, the all this supposed order. to get older. Yeah. Or it's supposed to get uh, or more chaotic in time. That's not true anymore. Uh, and you're seeing new star developments and new galaxies that shouldn't be where they are. Oh, yeah. Explain that. Because it keeps expanding. <clears throat> They're saying that, um, and I talked to another friend of mine, we were just talking about that that, that means that uh, <coughs> that wherever wherever that universe or galaxy is, um, time is different there. It's yes. Just, it's just it's different. different. And that's just the way God made it. Yeah. And there has to be a flowing or this volume of what they call ether that has to be there. And yeah. I kind of note that to being that's the breath of God. Yeah. That's what it is. Yes, that's right. I love it. It's another. Sure. That's just God just showing off. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm enjoying it. No. no, I love it. So. So if you go back to also in uh, Matthew 19, 25, now I'm going to go into these passages. We, we studied before this these things about the rich young man and the certain ruler, but I wanted to surmise them again with this aspect of the salvation is plural being mentioned. So in first in Matthew 19, these are not the same story, by the way, as all the church Andy tells you. That's the same person. No, no, different people approached him at different times. On that same event of him walking, they approached him at different folks approached him. Like, again, thousands would follow him. And so they told on that story of him being walking down a road or being followed, how could there not be the concept of knowing the different folks from the crowd approached him? That's all that's being presented here. But Ben Church, oh, no, it's the same guy. No, 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 no. Same instance, the same instance of him walking through town. Or, but it's people, actually, different folks approaching him. One guy in Matthew 19, 25 is the rich young man. He represents the 30 fruit yield people that are early maturity from the sperma seed. But he's short of the 60 fruit yield. That's why he wanted to just enter the kingdom of the heavens. But he also wanted to obtain life for the age, verse 16. In Matthew 19 is what it says. He wanted to obtain uh, life for the age. Obtain or maintain life for the age, which is the heavenly inheritance of the bride and diaphragm on the wedding feast. The disciples, understanding the maturity and the spirit required to get intimacy with Christ, said with great astonishment, who then can be ongoingly saved? I didn't write that in the book. That's how the book ends. In verse 25 of Matthew 19, they were saying, how can someone be ongoingly saved? They understood that the question was not about salvation singular in Christ. It's about someone who already knows who Jesus is. And in Matthew 19, 25, when they said, who then can be saved? It's in the plural. They knew, they're saying, wait a second. Who, who then can be, if you're requiring that, that's a lot of requirement to be ongoingly saved. So, because the alternative is, if you don't ongoingly get saved, you're in danger of ongoingly appellate. That's what Jesus mentioned in 2 Timothy 3, 9, or 2 Peter 3, 9. So, then you look at Mark 10, 26, the second uh, passage we studied before about this, the rich young man. Different rich young, similar description, but a different fruit yield person. This rich young man is not a sperma. He's a sporos, because the kingdom of the gods in view. He sort of the hundredfold fruit. He wanted to inherit, be worthy of reward for the, for the age. He wants to get the heavenly realm. So Matthew's about the heavenly realm, excuse me, but this guy wants the earthly realm, excuse me, in Mark. So the Mark guy wants earthly realm uh, context. Disciples again in verse 26 of Mark 10 said, oh, by the way, they're still greatly, now they're greatly amazed by who can be ongoingly saved. So whether it's in the heavens or whether it's on the earth, they're still amazed, like you're still requiring quite a bit to inherit. This is not easy either way. Either way, it's not an easy mail it in kind of process. You got to put yourself to task. And then, and then Luke, and then Luke is a different person. This time it's not a rich young man, it's a certain rich ruler. This person is the hundredfold fruit person. They do have the sporos, they are at that level, but they're not aware of mysteries. They want to do inherit the heavenlies. And in, and in verse, uh, life for the age, what it says in verse 18 and 22, they wanted to be found worthy of reward. And then they needed to leave behind the old theology. That was their problem. They didn't need to leave behind. Oh, say sorry. They wanted to leave behind their old theology. And if you go to chapter um, Luke 18, if you go there, you can see how they didn't want to. He wanted to leave behind what Jesus said. You got to leave behind your old theology. So go to Luke chapter 18. Luke 18. And then you have <clears throat> it's in verse 22, and Jesus said to him. Yet is one thing you are la you are wanting or, or lacking, uh, and that word wanting there is la pay. That means there's one thing that you have to, and the word la pay means to abandon, to leave behind. You have to leave behind 
all that you have. It's not physical wealth he's talking about. It's talking about all this old wine skin, all this old wine, all this stacked up theology, all this seminary time you spent, all the books you've written, all the sermons you've taught, all the people that know you as this kind of person. Leave it all behind. If you want to have the heavenly inheritance, I'm telling you what it takes. He's like, I can't. I can't, I can't do that. Well, then that's on you. I know it's hard, but that's what that, you want. What you want with that? You want treasure in heaven? That's what you got to do. That's what you got to do. You got to leave behind all that wealth of all that time spent, all that you've been identified as, all that you've put your life into. How many times people are going to do that? Probably not many. I don't know if anybody's ever done that. I do credit, is an odd way. Uh, Jim Baker with a big old book said I was wrong. He broke away from the whole PTL thing. Yeah. That's not at this level, but still, it's a, it's a turnabout face of a guy that was known for being this disgusting human, mm -hmm. and he just owned it. And like that's pretty wow. You don't you don't see that every day, you know? It's like wow. But I don't know of anybody who's left behind. Like I'm trying to think of a regular. Run the, if I don't miss. If I, tell me if you know somebody who's run, run the mill preacher who's turned away from all those years of doing that and then taught kingdom. I don't know. Has anybody done that that you know of that I, I don't know of? I don't know of anybody who's done that. I don't know of anybody. I mean Charles Stanley, God rest his soul. He's gone, and I, I bet you he's probably would he'd, he'd probably vomit worthy when he hears his son teach. Oh God. Nothing like him. But he did, Charles Stanley, write a book once and taught about outer darkness. I heard it and I in this little pamphlet he did one time. But that was it. So he knew it was not it was for the believer and it was a disinheritance. He mentioned that kind of stuff and consequence and it kind of went away in the ether. And he just went back to his, you know, pocket of salvation by grace through faith. But okay. Tony Evans I've heard teach about uh, different different aspects of the soul being saved differently and talk about inheritance and entrance. I mentioned because he's influenced by Dallas Seminary. I mentioned yesterday Elliot Johnson, uh, uh, Joseph Dillo. Those are guys at seminary that actually did teach this different aspects of things. But, but they weren't mainstream preachers, if you will, that had a whole you know, history of this and be identified as a, as a hunter fruit person and all of a sudden doing about face. So, but that's what Luke 18 is, is discussing. This is a different person. But again, whether it's in Matthew or Mark or Luke, no matter where you are in the spiritual ghost cycle chart, every time the apostles end with saying, um, what? Those having heard, and this time it's not the apostles mentioned per se directly, it says those having heard, which is them and other folks, said who then could be ongoingly saved? No matter who it is in view, a hundredfold person, a person who's short of the 60 fruit, a person who's short of the hundredfold fruit, no matter who it is in view, it, it, it's, they still all require an ongoing salvation. And the people hearing it, the apostles and the others, all understood, then, then who can do that? What, what, you're asking a lot. They understood it's more than just believing in him. They, they understood that. So in, in John 10, 9, he says it this way. In other words, it's in the plural again. We never did this before, looking at this word salvations, where it comes in plural in Scripture. So in John 10, 9, Jesus Yeshua is the door, the thera, the entrance, from which one must go through to have multiple salvations. I remember this way long, long ago when Sister Vicki, you once said this to me, if you remember this, many years ago, you go, wait a second, I was doing this whole study on doors and gates, and you're like, so what? And then we had, to, and you clarified, and, and I said, yeah, yeah, you're right. It's, it, all those, it, doesn't have, it could be eight doors, eight salvations, so what? All of them are in and through and by Jesus. And you were asking that question because I was kind of losing myself in it, and you had me come back and redefine, because it can be seen as, oh, you mean you just get Jesus, leave him behind and move on? No, <laughs> no, no. He's the reason why you have any and all salvations you have. The only one that's really not really with him in view directly is of covenant. That's the only salvation you have without him being directly in view. He's, he is indirectly in view because he's a promised Messiah to those of covenant. But he's not directly in view as the one you're trusting in who, who is the salvation. There. But everything else in Testament forward is all about him and in through and by him. And that's why he says he have ongoing salvations to go in and out and find through searching past your spiritual food. What a coincidence. Not only do you have ongoing salvations in him to go in and out, meaning he's a door that goes open. You have to continue to go through many doors. He's, that's where you find your spiritual searching of past your spiritual food. So he, he is the, he's that great shepherd, the chief shepherd. And it goes to mind, always reminds me, when I think of the word shepherd, thanks to Nancy talking me that book about Philip Keller. I always think about what the book said about him being a shepherd. And he went to the, I, the one image in that book where he talked about his sons went with him. You remember this part in the book where he went out there and he would take out all the weeds that would hurt the lambs. And he said it took him months to go out there on his hands and knees. And I did that this morning and yesterday morning. Yeah. Yes, I did. I truly did this. I pulled out weeds from the yard this morning. That I just little stink weeds, whatever they're calling it. I pulled them out, put them in a the trash can. But I'm just thinking this guy's on his hands and knees. I don't know about you, but I'm of, I'm of the age where if you can do this, good for you. But my knees hurt like the Dickens. I cannot do that for very long. No. So this dude's on his hands and knees at my age and older. 
and he's picking up for months, like day after day for months, all these little weeds that he knows, these little, um, he called them different names of what they were called, technically speaking. Mm -hmm. But he knows that the lambs eat those, they get like a diverticulitis, they get kind of like diseases or what all kind of stuff, right? And he just knows that. He's an agricultural guy, so he just weeds them all out, and his sons are helping him meticulously go through. Our neighbor, by the way, his husband and wife, they do this. I, I thought, that's the first time I've seen it in real life. Someone, as a kid, I did it as a kid growing up, but, but not like these. These are adults that take like eight hours in the day. They have a little small bucket, and she's on her, like her tuka, sitting Indian style. He's doing it. Mostly her does it. He does some of it. And she's picking out little weeds. I'm like, Vicky, what are you doing? She's taking the weeds out of our grass. And it is working because their grass was like patchy, and now it's greener than ours. I'm like, okay, I'm jealous. But then they took all this time to do that. I ain't, I ain't doing it. So, but they deserve that. But this is what this guy, this, this shepherd is doing that in real life. And that's what Jesus is doing for us. He's constantly making things ready for us so that, so that when you go into that next salvation, it's in your best interest that it's at the table set for you. That's what the table means. It means a mesa, a pasture, is set for you to enjoy the bounty of the next experience of the knowledge and the experience of, of Jesus deeper in your walk with him. How beautiful is that? Not only is he telling you, so when you learn a new truth, just so you know, that's him saying, I already planned that for you. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the way, it gets better. I plan for that truth to be resonated in you and wait till you see the benefits of it. You're going to see that too. I've already planned that out too. What? Yeah. That's pretty awesome. That's what he's talking about when he says he goes in and out and finds through searching the pasture, the spiritual food. That's a wonderful word picture of our Lord that loves us. I think it's just beautiful. And you miss out on that if you think, oh, there's just the one salvation in Christ. And I'm good. And no, he's ongoingly, actively engaged in our life. Then you see in Acts 2.21 and in 4.12, and I put a little parents in Romans 10.13. We'll look there. But he says, all salvations in testament are in and through, it says, I call upon the name of the Lord. You are in and through Christ and calling upon the name of Jesus, the author of salvation. He is the author of salvation. So in Acts 10, in Acts uh, 2, uh, 21, we can look there in Acts 2, 21. We see that Jesus even tells you, if, if people say, well, how do you know it's all in and through him? And you're saying there's more than one. It's all about him. There's, there's no focus away from him. It's just the opposite. It's just amplifying more that he has done and more that he is constantly doing and is yet to do. And in verse 21 of Acts 2, and it be everyone who may invoke the name of the Lord shall be ongoingly saved. Meaning again, if you look at the word call upon, is that also in the plural? Yes. So if you ongoingly call upon the Lord, you will have an ongoingly uh, salvation. So there is a, again, another parallel there to, again, how people don't understand. They have, it's a one-time calling and a one-time salvation. They're both in plural. Can't that one be like initial salvation for verse 21? It is. Okay. It is, but it, it, correct, it is. It is It is that, but it's okay. not But it's not just that. Okay. It's kind of like what Sister okay. Vicki was saying earlier about the kingdom of God. It does reference the aid, but not just the... It, people who are left behind. Okay. It, it, it's, the, it's the initial call? salvation and all of them. But it's, it's starting there, obviously, but it's all of them. How can you call on the name of the Lord unless you already know him? I, well... Because he infuses salvation <clears throat> into you. I mean... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but and and this. Then you call on. Yeah. So, so to but to your point here, to the audience here, to your point, is the Jews. Peter's talking to the Jewish okay. people. They're of covenant. They already know who he is, and he's saying to call on them. To okay. call on him. To your point. I got you. So it is initial salvation, but not so much for the Gentile audience. It's for the Jewish audience who know of covenant who he is, and he's saying you need to call on. You know the one you rejected. You need to call on him, because that he is the Messiah. That's pretty clear now. He walked away from the grave. We all know this. <laughs> so. <laughs> They're like, he did what? Yeah, we don't try to lie. You saw a lot of people come out of the graves and talk to you. Can you imagine them trying to lie? You saw Abraham and Esther and Deborah and Eve and Rachel. Stop lying. You saw them. You saw Job say, you better do this, man. You saw them. <laughs> you know what I mean? I wonder who those people were. I wonder what they had to say. How could they not say, y'all made a big mistake? Just so you know, look, because I'm walking around. How you explain me? They're like, aren't you supposed to be dead? I know, right? I'm walking around. I'm telling you that he's the guy. <laughs> so... The one that you murdered, he's the guy. And you go, what am I talking about? That's Matthew 27, 52. Other sleeping saints rose from the grave when Jesus was raised. That's what the scripture says. So then you go to Acts in, in chapter 4 and verse 12. So Acts 4, verse 12, he, he says here, and, and, and again, I thank you for Brother Todd telling me. I get too excited sometimes, and I get so fast. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I got I got. I got to slow. But God's word is pretty awesome, man. When you're here, Vicky's like, put the brakes on, man. Like a 10 speed, turn down the dial, right? <laughs> turn down the, yes, Tracy, yes. In, in the Greek, yes. Um, is shall, it's not will. You in chapter 2? Yeah, back where we were in okay. Acts 2, 21. 
is in the Greek is shall still like a conditional thing? I mean, because it doesn't say will. I mean, I know the yeah. Greek and English are a little different yeah. in, in the structure. So the reason, so that word shall is actually um, in the English. Uh, when it says on the left side, so tier, so that's the so tier, ta, so there, yeah, who may call, who yeah, who, who oh, may invoke okay. the name. It's epi, yeah, it's epi yeah. yeah, yeah, kalim. Okay, ta. May and might should and shall. They're they're putting words. those words in there, but they're putting those words in there in English to try to explain that suffix ending that's continual. That's why they're doing that. Okay. They're they're trying to explain in English what they're what the Greek is doing better at. They should have just said it's a message. What it should say is those who want to go only invoke. In the name of the Lord shall have an ongoing mm -hmm. salvation, but they used English interpolation and said may and shall instead of just will. Instead, instead of just saying ongoingly invoke because it's in the continual tense mm -hmm. and ongoingly salvation because in the continuing tense mm -hmm. should have just left it as it was. But they're trying to make it more English friendly when you read it, and they didn't see that well, it doesn't make sense. Ongoingly call, ongoingly save. I mean, I'm just going to say may and shall. <laughs> so, but I think they did the right thing for the wrong reasons. They're trying to make it easy to read in English. But they did it for the wrong reasons. That that's what they're but without honoring the language. I don't mind that being your goal, make it easy to read. But as long as you don't differ from the change language, the meaning, yeah. you change. Like well, we talked about yesterday say, with the old Bimatos thing. Remember, they think that's a reward seat of this review, yeah. and it's not the word doesn't mean that. But if they were making it continue, continual, it should have just said, it "Is calling on." That's continuous. Yeah. You know? Yep. I mean, in English. It is calling on. Yeah. Yeah, you should say that. Yeah. Is calling on, but how would you say in English? The you're an English teacher. How would you say the salvation in plural? Instead of saying salvation ongoing, how would you say it? to express that same thing? Is there a better way is, of English to is say? Probably is being saved. Okay, is being saved. Okay. Is having uh, having salvation. Probably. So being saved, but it still being, but it still would express a continuing saved. process. Yeah, because it's okay. a continuous thing. Yeah. So yeah. So it's just that. So you just you're the English person, so you know that you just had yourself. You take a little pause there. They, I mean, they did this, not just on the spot, right? So it makes me frustrated because, like, they didn't put, you just put, what, less than 10 seconds into that, and you got a better interpretation than they did. <laughs> and they put a lot of time into it. It just frustrates me. Like, how can you just, just take the language, man? Just stay with the point. And I, I would have expected it better if they did what you just did. I wish they would have done that, but they, mm -hmm. they, they didn't. So, they invoked their doctrine into their interpretation. Yeah, that's it, the they did. They invoked, that's, that's right. The thing, yeah. And that's the thing too, but for example, um, we, do you know who Sparis Odiadia is, you know him? Yeah. yeah. So the book, the work study, the Greek work study book. So I have his book, I met him personally, we met him personally in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Zodiac. Sparis Odiadia writes the Greek work study book, he attends a church in Chattanooga called the Woodland Park Baptist Church. We, we went there. It's 100% through and through Lordship Salvation. It's like, the, it's like the beacon of the beacons are lit for Lordship there. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> They, Lordship calls for aid. So they're, they're over there. So they're in, in verse 12 of chapter 4. Um, th that's what they, they, he will actually do this thing where he'll change the wording, Zodiati does. So he, in, in Acts chapter 4, I said he was, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, in Acts 4, verse 12, it said, And there is no salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven which has been given among men, which men can be saved. Again, it's, it's an ongoing tense there. And then left side of your margin, Tracy, there's the word must. Mm -hmm. That word is actually the correct word. because yes. it's, it's, It says a, a need of, you have a need to be saved through, a need for ongoing salvation is only in and through Jesus. So those who say, how did you know it's in and through Jesus? Because he said you must have Jesus to have any ongoing salvation. You, you must. But so Zodiades, when I, when I talked to him, going back to him, I, I would talk to him and, and he had this nice conversation and he's a great intellectual guy about Koine Greek. But if you read his book, by the way, he will, he will take the book and he will tell you the definition of a term, and then he'll give his, his, his interpretation. And our old life, well, long ago, about, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, Bobby, I'm not gonna say his last name, but Bobby, he actually said, look, it says right here, you're wrong about, see, Apollea is not for us, because it says here, I go, stop. <laughs> Read the first part, and then stop. That's the definition, everything else is his thoughts. Well, that's not true, yet, yes it is. Yes it is. He's telling definition, everything else is what he believes, it's his theology coming out. And then, well, let's see his writing it. Oh my God. I've met him, I've talked to him, I'm telling you the truth. That's how he wrote the book. He doesn't mean to do anything evil, he's just showing you what, that's the same thing I would do. Uh, he's gonna tell you what the word means and tell you, and tell you what the word means technically and then tell you how it applies in his, in his opinion. But that's not the same thing. And, and so he was saying that the same thing. 
So as though the eyes can read his book, and if you had the word study, you will find there's many things that he'll go, they'll, they, that's, that's why he's convincing. They'll say, oh, he's Lordship Salvation, so he must be right, because he's affirming what I believe, and he knows more than I do about the language, so therefore he's, uh, I'm right, uh -huh, I'm right. Well, that's not how it works, because he's taking a definition and ignoring. For example, I'll give one example of this. And first, John, I remember asking him, I said, so, so you said that, uh, that the um, continuing thing there in the King of Tents about being an overcomer, that he who overcomes, he who is saved ongoing, uh, doesn't have habitual sin ongoing. So, okay, so habitual sin, you can't do like smoking and drinking and, and whatever it is, you know, all these different things. I said, how come it's always the homosexuality, it's always these sins that we see outwardly that society right. labels. Right. Why isn't it, right. why isn't it like, I, I, I it's not like, you know, the things that maybe like you get constantly angry or, or you maybe you overeat the wrong things or I mean, why, why isn't it that you covet Plus different things? Well. But why isn't it things that you can't really visibly see or you don't, or they're more or less, they're less, they're less, you know, fringent on things. Uh, and he goes, well, it, 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 it means that you have to be continuously. So I may have a problem with this, but I'm not continually. I go, okay, so let me ask you, I talked to him personally. I said, let me ask you a question about the whole issue when it comes to the loving. This is after the interaction we had in seminary that Lee was there to hear me say in front of a classroom, the same thing I said to him face to face. I said, how about me? I know that I'm a person in Christ. I know for a fact. I'm, I'm the old Johnny Cash person. I was there when it happened. I ought to know. So that's what his song says. So, so therefore, I'm saying to you that I know I'm saying, but I do have a habitual problem of sinning. And he goes, well, here's an accent. What do you mean? I said, well, I don't love the Lord, the God, that my heart, mind, soul, and strength. I love my neighbor as myself. And I'm required to do so. Jesus said that's everything rests on that. So he goes, well, it doesn't mean that. No, no, okay, why do you do, why do, you do that? Why, that's what the seminary teacher guy said. And he goes, well, because that's, that's, that we all fall short of that. This is talking about your sins that you have. Oh, that's a free pass on that. It reminds me a lot of the Catholic people I talked to one time. And I asked the guy about when it says here that all have sinned and, and come short of the glory of God. And he said, yeah, so. I, go, my, my, I said, my point is that Mary is a sinner. And he goes, no. And he goes, I go, you mean no. And then, then he said to me, he said, was Jesus part of all? Oh, my gosh. No, he's writing the book. <laughs> he's the author of the book. The all is us. And he goes, no, that's how you want to see it. See, the all is everybody, Jude and Jesus. So if Jesus can't be seen as a sinner, then neither can she. We're supposed to understand that. I'm like, wow. But he, that's the same thing to me as Odonis is doing. He's like, oh, I'm going to ignore this truth over here so I can just parse that out so that my theory can still make sense. And, and no, no, yeah, yeah, no, you can't just ignore a material fact because your theory gets all of a sudden torn apart. But that's what they do. It's just an amazing thing to me. But I wanted to point that out. They just, so when these salvation scriptures are being shared, doesn't mean they're going to go, oh, wow, thank you so much, Brother Lee, Brother Jim. Oh, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, right. They're going to go like, oh, yeah, right, Airhead. They're not going to like what you're saying. They're not going to like what you're saying. They're going to continue. Where is that scripture when it's, where someone bows down to a disciple and for me it was to Peter as that was and it said you know don't do that I'm not do that yeah. only do that oh Jesus yeah and it, it makes me think of that I always think of if Mary was alive today yeah and so I would do that to her she'd be at saying me like what are you doing I'm not yeah. I'm not yeah. worth you know yeah 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 I'm just I'm I'm just a man so just a woman, a woman right? yeah and, and to me <laughs> she's and I can imagine her in heaven here in the if she was able to hear but she's not but but if she was being told but folks who die and go there well, most Catholics might even see her. It's the, that's the irony of it all. She'll be on the other side of heaven where the promises are. They're on the other side. They don't even see her. But I bet you those who have told her, people like us who get to see her and go when we die, I bet they, they tell her that. I might go, they're saying, what about me? She's, yeah. <laughs> because, because that wasn't her intention at all. She's a godly woman. Right. It's just so frustrating. Yeah. It's all, she's one of the godliest women in the whole Bible. Right. And, and then she's just bastardized. It's yeah. like, oh my gosh, man, you're taking it. And who's behind that? It's, it's, it's that's Satan. He's just jealous. Because God used this young woman, not just a, not just a girl, a young, 14 years old, 14. and she's godly beyond her years, and Satan just didn't like that. Well, tough, deal with it. Well, she was and she stayed that way the whole she, time. She was reviled when she was alive when they said to Jesus, we be not born of fornication. How does yeah. that reflect on Mary? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. She was just despised. And, it's, and so anyway, I just, yeah, they, yeah. So they don't, yeah, you're right about that. She should have said, and by the way, it's the other thing about the, the Magnifica, they call it. She says, yeah. oh, my Lord calls out for my Savior. How do you, why do you, why does she say Savior if she says my Savior? Why would she need a Savior if she's not a sinner? They don't know what to say to that. 
Because the Magnificat. They, they even called it the Magnificat. Yeah. What's that? Correct. Correct. And if you keep, and if you, and because they, because they, and it's a, it's what that was the old saying. Oh, the table, table web we weave, and push back to deceive. It's like, well, if she's understanding her mom's not, if her mom's not, then keep, keep, keep going, keep going. <laughs> You're in trouble now. <laughs> you know. So anyway, so that would mean that would then nobody ever died. There'd be a whole litany of a generation going, "How y'all doing? We're the Eternals." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. yeah. I mean, think about it. <laughs> like, weren't you around during Jacob and Esau? Yeah, I'll tell you all about it. Sit down. I'll tell you about it. <laughs> yeah, right. But they don't think about that. So in in, in, uh, in Romans ten thirteen, he says it again for those uh, anybody who call on the name of the Lord uh, again. It's the continual calling. Should be continually saved, so it's there as well. I was just highlighting you those verses in Acts and in Romans that speak to the ongoing salvation in the same text of calling upon continually the name of the Lord for continuously salvations. So then you go to Acts 14 and verse 9. So Acts 14 and verse 9. Here's another, um, another one here. So in Acts 14 and verse 9. It says, this man had heard Paul speaking, who looked intently on him and seeing that he had faith to be restored. And you see this word restored here. It's on, uh, in your, let me see here. Let's look to it, find so, so. The left side of your margin, it's actually, it should say saved. It's an ongoing salvation. It's soze, right? It's, a, it's an ongoing salvation on the left side of your margin. It's interpreted on the right side, the word restored, but it should say being saved, as Tracy said, or ongoingly saved. But again, it's a it's another tense. So, and, it, and it's and it's and you see that the word it, it seemed that he had not just faith, but that faith, the faith that's not just rooted in the passive faith and believing in God, but the ongoing faith to continue to trust in Him. So it's it's an interesting uh, fact here that he's pointing out again. This man who was disabled again, he didn't just have faith in Christ. He was ongoingly knowing that he wanted to have a continuous walk with Him. Then you go to the Jerusalem Council process in Acts 15. And, and verse 1, and this is where it's interesting about our Hebrew roots people, which need to understand this. And some having come down from the Judea uh, taught that the, that the brethren, if you are not circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be continually saved. Do you see the problem with Hebrew roots movement? They're trying to connect legalism to ongoing salvations, and it's just not true at all. So not only was the Jerusalem Council to show you that it wasn't even about circumcision or law of Moses, it was about the one new man in Christ. They don't understand. So therefore, they didn't understand that Jesus is the reason, the core, the cause, the, the effect, the author, the finisher, the, and the, 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 the vessel from which you must ha- attach yourself to him to have ongoing salvation. There's no outward show of keeping Jewish law that's going to do that. But they were saying there was. And, and that's why, again, in, in the same chapter of Acts 15, in verse 11, they go on and say, but though the favor of the Lord we trust to be saved ongoing. So for those who are Hebrew Roots Movement, you say, okay, congratulations. You just, you just sealed your fate. You have now concreted the doors of other salvations. Good luck with that. The, the scripture just says that. So in Acts 15, 1 and 11, put it together. What he's saying is, if you have a person who believes in the kingdom and you hold on to Hebrew Roots, you have now shut yourself off from any future advancement of maturity. You have definitively shut yourself off. Because he just said so. It doesn't, that, that, that can't do that in verse 1 of chapter 15. But chapter 15, verse 11, but Christ can do that. So let it go. But no, they, they're too proud and peacocking about, look what I can do. Look how different I am. Look how intelligent I am. No, you just, you just look how idiotic that is. You just sealed your fate. You will be internally, you'll, just say eternal, you'll be for the rest of your life immature. You'll never get to maturity. You never will. Sorry. You're at the best, at the best you're at lower level. You're not going to be 60 fruit. You will not because you just refused. Sorry. That's your, that's your, that's on, that's on you. That's why I put on here that the law of Moses does not provide ongoing salvation. It's only through God's favor granted to those in Christ who are believing faithfully to his word will have ongoing salvations. Initial salvation is sealed. So it's an interesting, like, interesting thing here that they don't see this. So then go to 1 Corinthians 3.15. Go to 1 Corinthians 3.15. So it, the first, we started off yesterday with the mystery words that we never looked at in Scripture, and now we're going into this salvation plural words we didn't really look into all of these passages that's what we're doing to today here okay 
We good? Fine. Okay. I was going to say. <laughs> Sorry. In some ways, no, no, no. You know, God gives the initial breath of life to Adam, and then he didn't have to do that afterwards. Adam continued breathing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ongoing. It's an ongoing breath. And that's and, and in 1 Corinthians 3.15, he said, we know this passage about that the work of anyone be consumed, he'll suffer a loss, but he himself will be saved, but as through fire, an ongoing salvation. So if you do suffer that loss, you'll have an ongoing salvation. Because you just had a salvation in Christ, and you suffered loss, you're still going to, one day later on, you're going to be, that's why people say to me, why don't they stay in the Hades or Gehenna or Lake of Fire? Because God's grace abounds more than sin, that's why. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And they're still going to have another salvation later on. God's going to spare them later on at some point. So they're going to get saved. Even though they get, even though you're the worst of us, if I'm the worst of, my, of, of, of those in Christ, it doesn't change the fact I'm going to have at least two salvations. At least the one in Christ and the one later on being saved out of the fire. I'm going to have that one at least. I'm going to have at least two. I'm saved now in Christ. And I'll be also again saved, ongoingly saved again in the future. When it's all said and done, when, it, when the day of God is over, I will not be left in a lake of fire. Oh, no, I won't. I'm coming out. <laughs> so if I am the worst of us, then I'm going to be still out, like Judas, for example, or, or Cain, or whoever it may be. You're going to come out. What's that? Well, uh, what, the three verses talk about the work of each. What kind yeah. of work of, do you think they're speaking about? Well, that's you're about in verse 13 of Acts, no, like of, of 13, 1 Corinthians. 14 to 15. Yeah, yeah. So that's the, that's the, the previous verse in verse 12. That's the gold, silver. That's your actual maturity of works. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the gold, silver, costly stones, and then wood, hay, and stubble. Where they line up. Yeah. Okay. And remember, we saw the other day the the God God said in a great house is gold and silver, wooden yeah. and earthen. Right. He has yeah. four, but here there's six. Yeah. Right. So he says gold. He, he he didn't he didn't mention precious stones. That's the bride. She's always veiled. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. But then the other one he mentioned wood and clay. Wood and earthen is, is, is clay. Earthen is clay. So wood, hay, and straw is mentioned here. He mentions wood, hay, and then straw is the most flammable of all of those. Oh, right? So, so it the is thinner. It's, 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 yeah. it's like, a, like that kindling wood you put in your fireplace. Wood, like wood's flammable, but the kindling wood starts it, right? So the straw is like really flammable. So that's, he puts straw in here because those are the folks that are under, yeah. Where he mentions in his great house, gold and silver, heavenly. Wood and earthen on the earth. He didn't mention straw because oh, they're okay. under the earth. He didn't mention precious stones because they're the bride veiled. Oh, cool. That's why he didn't mention that. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I'm glad you said that. That's why he didn't mention that. So that's interesting how you, you see these six here, but you only saw four in Timothy we talked about yesterday. Because two are not mentioned. Again, precious stones veiled because it's the bride. And straw because it's highly flammable represents those under the earth who are just disinherited with a consequence of negative recompense. No one wants that. You don't, I don't want that. That's sad. So... But that's where I, I put on the on the paper the works of one in Christ who are built on wood hand stuff will be burned up, but he'll be ongoingly saved from destructions, like I mentioned there, um, and restored on the uh, on the new earth at the end of day eight, day of God. Then Philippians two twelve, of course we know this one really well about working out your salvation. It, it says work out, which was, which means intensely, laboriously, tirelessly. And I think about this. I think about I think about people like like Brother Lee to have the, the, the black belt what he does in martial arts if you didn't know that he has like three black belts wow. it, you don't get that like overnight right cool. so he has to he has to work tirelessly intensely right oh, yeah. so and if you yeah. and, right but to, but to say that yeah Jim yeah yeah Jim knows he's funny <laughs> they had a little sparring competition that little funny joke wow. right now. yeah <laughs> Jim said I didn't know a person until I fought him <laughs> so there was a lot so he and he and he mentions about, so in Philippians 2, 12, he says to, to intensely labor tirelessly for your salvation. That doesn't seem to make sense. Imagine if, 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 if Brother Lee was told, you know, I, I can just mail it in, read a book, and be just as good as you. He'd laugh. He's like, that's, that's not even possible. But folks who believe in Christ believe that's true. They believe you can, just, you can just learn about Jesus, give your life over to Jesus as your Savior. And this just means when he says work, work out your salvation, that just means i got to like always think about Jesus and pray to him and, and consider him in all my choices in my life. And I can read about a book about how to do uh, Chai Chi and you know, all the different Wang Chungs and whatever else. I, it doesn't change the fact if I don't get on the mat and do some actual physical work, I'm not going to, there's, there's no labor intense involved. I'm not going to learn nothing, right? I got, I got to put it to action. So yeah. th these, these people are like, they don't understand what working out means. It means to t intensely labor tirelessly. Yeah. But they act like, no, it just means I'm going to start think about Jesus a lot, meditate a lot. No, no, no. And then, of course, in, in 1 Peter 4, 17, he says that we are scarcely safe. And, and that's the thing, again, I've mentioned many times already before, and, and Peter doesn't 
mince words with that. In 1 Peter 4, 17, if you look at that, he's, he's describing, uh, he, he says, because the season, and why does he say because or hoti? He says, but if a Christian, which again, is not everybody in Christ, but those who actually are living as an ambassador of Christ, that's what the word means, I didn't write the book. So he said, let him not be ashamed, let him glorify God in his name, because, so who is the audience? Those who are in Christ and living as ambassadors to him, and more specifically, mature ones, because that's the audience in the first Peter chapter one. He's writing to mature ones. That's why he says in the very first verse, going back to that, he, he tells you that these people, he describes them in the entire context here as people that are chosen, these people that are actually of, he talks about the, in verse two, chosen ones or according to the foreknowledge, the, the, the foreknowledge, the prognosis ones of the Father into obedience and, and all this. The whole entire chapter one tells you he's mature ones in view. But then you go into verse 17 in 1 Peter 4, he said, because the season, in other words, you should glorify God in his name because you're a, because, because you're a Christian, because the season is coming for the judgment to begin from the house of God. And if it begin first from us, which is protos, right? So, because, by the way, uh, the house of God is in, in a bigger house than us. We're in Testament. There's also the house of Moses, which includes God's people of covenant, and, and they're going to get judged in tribulation, aren't they? Uh, yeah, they are. And so that's why we're the protos, by the way, if you ever thought about that. If it start first with us, it's the first one here. And even though it is, a, it is an adverb here, but it also, it's not really technically that way of me on protos. I'm just letting you know there is a judgment prior to us and for those of the Jewish people. But he said, what are the end of those who are disobedient of the glad tidings? And in verse 18, that the righteous person is scarcely safe. And, and that means with much with difficulty. That's what it means. It means with much difficulty. It's verse 18 of 1 Peter 4. Okay. I think I put 17, but no, I should have put 18. Okay. should have put 18 on there. My mistake. So I should have put 1 Peter 4, 18, not 17. I guess Lot demonstrates that he's written as that righteous man and yeah. he was scarcely saved out of Solomon yeah. and Gomorrah. Yeah, he was scarcely safe. It is. Yeah. And and it, 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 and that's what people always get a mistake on. I set them up with that question. Is Lot saved or lost, you would say, and they say lost. And you go to 2 Peter 2 and it calls him righteous Lot, righteous Lot, righteous Lot, righteous Lot. And they go, um... Well, um, <laughs> so what do you do with that? They don't, how does it make sense? Deal with it. That, that's the truth. But here, I was asked the question, why did God have Peter right, use this word scarcely, which means molus, which means with much difficulty, are we safe? What, what is that supposed to mean? And I was, why did he use the word gloriously saved? Wonderfully saved. Beautifully saved. Guaranteedly saved. Assuredly saved. Sealed saved. He could have all these different... But he used the word scarcely, molus, with much difficulty, are we saved? Uh, no, I'm, I'm saved by grace through faith. It's a done deal. What do you mean, scarcely, with much difficulty? Yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't hard at all for me. Yeah. I learned, Jesus told me who he was, and I trusted that. That was all because of him. Pretty easy. <laughs> I didn't do anything. It's like me watching Lee put somebody down. I didn't do anything. Appreciate it. <laughs> so I, I, you know, it's like I don't get it. So here he uses this phrasing, and so it's an interesting thing where uh, here, people just don't understand about the working out salvation and how we're, again, also in this process of being scarcely saved. That's why you're working it out. Because all you have is a salvation that Christ gave to you. Right. But to get the other salvation, it does take difficulty. It does take, like Philippians said, some tireless, laborious, ongoing work. What are you going to ask me? Well, something? I was just going to say, what's out? That's for the bride. This is the bridal salvation, right? Well, it's, it's not just for the bride. It's for anybody who's maturing in their faith. So it's for smarter people, definitively. It's okay. for mature ones. Right. Mature ones who are walking in the 30, 60, or 100 fruit. So it's not just the bride. I would include that, the bride and the maidens. Okay. As we say bride and maidens, that's another way of saying the mature ones. Okay. So 30, 60, 100 are the mature ones of sperma. And so those are, that's the terminology I would, that's the scripture uses that terminology. Mature ones are 30, 60, 100 fruit yield people. And so the 30, 60 are bridal maidens. And the hundred are the bride. Okay. Well, faithful ones that will be one day revealed as, or they'll be the betrothed bride, and then the revealed bride later. So you have those three different classes of people. But Paul never was assertive enough to think he would say, I'm the bride, so that's why we don't want to say that either. I'm not saying that. <laughs> we just want to strive for that. And so that's why he even said in 1 Corinthians 9, he doesn't want to be one who's disapproved because he held himself to a higher standard of never want to assume. And we don't want to do that. So, but we definitely know we're mature ones. We just don't know what level God sees us at. That's up to him. I, I, I don't know that. So, but, that, but that's just being a humble person before God, just saying, I know from what you've given us, we've got to be mature ones. Wherever you are in that line of how you see us, 
level maturity of entry level, full maturity, or the, the best of all, the faithful one, I don't, I just only hope and pray and continue to strive to have that. You don't want to ever mail it in. It's almost like a, imagining an athlete who, who, or, who, or anybody in academics or in music or whatever, the arts, when you achieve a certain level, it's, people even say it's harder to sustain that because now you've gotten the pinnacle and now you feel like you can just relax. And that's why you don't want to feel like you're there because it's the striving aspect of it is what actually motivates you to continue to, to improve, continue to get better. Don't think you've ever arrived. So that's what that is. It's like, I mean, as a teacher, I'm sure you do that. You always want to get better helping your students, right? And Howard Hendricks used to say, if the student hasn't learned, the teacher hadn't taught. And I always feel bad about that. If, I, if someone doesn't understand something, I blame myself first. I don't blame the person. I'm like, I suck. How, do I, how can I do that better? <laughs> how can I do that? <laughs> so it's just, it always puts the onus on the teacher when you think that way to improve yourself, self-examination. And that's what Scripture is talking about. Be self-examining how you walk with Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 through 11 is another, I didn't, we, we've known this verse very well. I'll put it in parents because I've used it so many times. But in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 8, 8 through 11 is the, the passage in which he says with the Bema seat, but the part that people like to leave out is where he says you have to give an account of the things done, good or bad, in verse 10. And also verse 11 about knowing the terror of the Lord. They leave those two things out. <laughs> they leave out the last part of verse 10 in 2 Corinthians 5, 10. That we're going to appear before this bema seat, and the word, the word bema, bema tos, is the same word used in Matthew 27, 19. I mentioned to you yesterday that Pontius Pilate judged Jesus, but again, the, the more important thing, even when they want to excuse away that as some reward thing, they don't want to talk about the verse 10, the latter part, which is according to what was performed, whether good or bad. And that goes back to again these salvations, and again the terror of the Lord. You, that's why, and again, terror doesn't terror doesn't motivate me. People misunderstand me. I had to happen to me earlier this week. Oh, you're saying the terror of God motivates you? No, it doesn't. It's just the parameter that guides me to know that I must stay within the guide, guide rails, the guardrails of following God because I love him. But I know if I do act up, I got my up and comings coming to me now and later. It's not fun. So in 2 Thessalonians 2.10, it says, To those in Christ who do not love the truth of Jesus, living the word, and disobeying rebellion with deceit, falsehood, hypocrisy, the written word, so they not be ongoingly saved. And again, that's 2 Thessalonians 2.10. So this is people during the tribulation period who again will be sent the delusion to believe the lie. And why would God do that? Well, he tells you why if you read the text, like I just read it to you and how the Greek should be said, because they had, again, a disobedient, rebellious attitude of the falsehood and hypocrisy. They weren't taking it seriously. And because of that, they will not be ongoingly saved. You can't take God tongue-in-cheek and say one thing and act another one. And, and again, I mentioned on the other day, but... I, I don't know how many times you've seen this in your own life. People will say to me things about, we have to, uh, I'm a believer in Jesus, and I'm going to have all the rewards. And you, they open up their Bible, and they still have the gold fringe on it. And, you, and, I'm, and I'm like, dude, you don't use that, do you? And you hear the crinkle, 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 crinkle like it's brand new. I'm like, you don't use that. I mentioned to you the other day. This is, these, these are these people. They act like, no, I got it. No, but you don't even read it. You don't even spend time with them. So, I mean, come on. And so in Second, in second Peter, we talked about it up there yesterday. We can't uh, turn there. That's the passage about where, he says, better to have not known Jesus than to know him, to turn back. Right? We saw that yesterday, 2 Peter 2, 20 to 22. And then you have also in, in, in 1 Timothy 2, 4. Now, it's a new one we haven't seen yet. So in 1 Timothy in 2, 4, he says that God desires all men. This is where people must understand all humanity. No. He's talking to Timothy, who has a mixed uh, father and mother of Jewish and Gentile descent. And he means both kinds of men, all men, Jew or Gentile, all men not just Jews. So the all men here is for Jew and Gentile. So when he says he desires all men, not all humans, all men, Jew, Jew or Gentile, to be saved ongoing. That's God's desire. And that's God's thalo. It's, it's, it's thalo will, right? He, he wants that. And to come in an accurate knowledge of the truth. What's interesting here, again, he, he says it, it's, 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 the, it's actually, it should say thalai. So it's the different aspect. It's not thalo, it's thalai. It's actually similar to Thalo, it's executive will, but it's written in a way that shows God's executive will, but in his delight, what delights him. Yes? You know, a lot of times in the milk churches, I don't think they even discuss rewards. I tried with my mother one time to mention the concept of rewards, and she just blew me off, and I'm like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, they don't. <laughs> yeah, they don't. And I didn't have the information of the more recent years at that time either, but I knew about rewards. Yeah, they all, <laughs> they all just, yeah. Some, some will take it. We mentioned yesterday, right, there's a guy that says to me, oh, we all know we all won't hear well done, good and faithful servant. I'm like, oh, really? But then he thought that the negative part of it is just 
losing out on rewards we talked about. Some have just more than others. So that they don't know about it or they do know about it, they limit it to more or less, but you still have rewards. Some have rewards, some have just less. I'm like, so that's the negative? <laughs> so well, the that's all like, they like I, you could have had this, but you didn't want to strive for it, so yeah. you're not gonna be able to have this. So that's yeah, I mean that is negative. It, 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 yeah. yeah, but they think that's all it is, remember? Yeah. Right. So they do see that. They do see a negative, but they don't, they stop short of the two kinds of negative, missing out on what you could have had, but also the, the, the consequence for doing it just arrogantly, rebelliously, you know, sinfully, that's a whole different thing. So then you, when you look at, um, for this version, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 4, again, we talked about the word there is saved on going again. You can see that. And also, not just to be saved on going, but he wants you to come into the epinosis. So God's delight is for people to have an ongoing salvation because he knows by having that, you're going to come into an epinosis of him, right? So that you have the knowledge is also a part of continuing salvation. It's how you know you're being continually saved when you're continually growing in God's word. You have more knowledge about God, God and his word, that's proof and evidence that you're having continual salvation. That goes back to Hebrews chapter 12, when he says every son he loves, he disciplines. That means he teaches a new skill set. The more, the more new skill sets you learn about who God is and his word, the more you know that God's loving on you as a child, or as a, he calls son of God. So, and then he, again, in, the, in Acts uh, 18, 24, and 26, the deeper knowledge I'm referencing there is when you have the interaction between Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos, if you remember, when they, take, they have more accurate information. Remember that? That goes back. I've loved this passage a lot for people who, who say, oh, come on, there's only just one level of knowledge in God's word. You, you keep saying there's seed within a seed, and you're making this stuff up. And I'm like, no, I'm not. This is the passage I love to go to to show them that you can know God's word, but then you have a problem with the actual depth, depth of God's word. So in Acts chapter 18... And this is the passage about the certain uh, Jew named Apollos, Acts 18, 24. He was a native of Alexandria, an eloquent man, being powerful in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Now, what they're going to tell you is he wasn't saved. Uh, okay, sure, right. What? But Yeah, they'll say this to you. I'm serious. That. What's that? I've heard of that. You've heard it, right? Yeah. Well, he's powerful in the scriptures. I, I know. They'll say he's just, he's just acumen. He doesn't know Jesus, though. He's a professor and oh. not a believer. He's 18 <laughs> no, inches short, see? He knows it up here, but not inches. here. He's 18 inches short. But that's the head to the heart. They, they say, right? They say that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Professor, but not possessor. Possessor. Yeah. 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 And then this, this person was being instructed in the way of the Lord. The way of the Lord, but he still doesn't know who he is. Okay, that makes sense. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm being instructed. And, 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 and I'm being instructed in the way of English, but I don't know what it is. You, you just talk, you're telling me every day. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. So, and being fervent also taught accurately, uh, again, the things concerning Jesus. He taught accurately. But he doesn't know who he is. <laughs> okay. That makes zero sense. And you can't teach accurately. Fervent in the spirit. I know. Fervent in the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Fervent in the spirit. I know. Yep. And accurately teaching about Jesus. But he doesn't know who he is. Yeah, sure. Okay. And being acquainted only with the immersion of John. That's where they get their, their hook in and say, see, that proves it. No, it just proves that he didn't go on from John's teaching to Jesus' that's teaching. Right. That's all. Yeah. About what the depth of it all meant. That's all it meant. Just, the depth he's missing. That's all. And he, that's why it says in verse 26, this is the real big punch. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue until, or and, Aquila and Priscilla said, uh, uh, son, say second mirror. And they explained to him, they expounded what it means, more accurately, the way of God. As in, you can know depth, but you don't know what you don't know. So you can be a person who is an heir of, of the kingdom of the God. You could actually be a hundredfold fruit saint and know a lot about scripture, depth of God's word, and of the kingdom of the God. You don't know what you don't know. <laughs> and so, and Priscilla and Aquila are like, Son, 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 son. You know, you, not, not bad, but let me show you something. <laughs> and then they're like, walk off. And then he's like, oh, okay. Uh, how do you know that? Uh, it's this guy named Paul. You may have heard of him. He was taught by Jesus three years. By who? Yeah, personal, three years. Kind of big deal. Personal tutoring. The apostles didn't have personal tutoring. He did. He's kind of different. So we learned from him. And there he's like, wow, pretty cool guy. Yeah. So anyway, so with that being said, you, you see also on this, on James now, in James 2 to 14, this is where the other passage comes in about salvation, about those who get confused with salvation by works and faith and about works is dead and all that kind of malarkey garbage you'll hear. And yet, so I got to address James. I'm not going to leave that out. You can't leave that out talking about salvation. You got to bring this up because I'm not going to run from it. They're going to go to it like it's their safe harbor, like you're doing freeze tag when I was a kid. I got base. You can't touch me. <laughs> so I, got, I got my scripture. You can't get me. I got it. I got it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like whatever. You ever that as a kid? Freeze tag? Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome, yeah. man. Yeah. Remember that? Freeze! 
When you get a big family, it's a great entertainment, buddy. Oh, yeah. When you're poor and big family, it's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Freeze! <laughs> so in, in James 2, 14, he said, he said, but what advantage, my brethren, or what, what again, what, what profit is it if anyone say that he has, he has faith, and that is, uh, again, it, the, back on the previous page, if anyone say that if, if faith he will have works but not have, that the, the faith, uh, that faith, not able to say, the, faith, the faith to save him is not able. I can't say it. I'm saying it all backwards. So, but that's the verse in verse 14. It says, if you have faith without works, that faith can't save you. And that word save is in the ongoing tense there, right? So what a coincidence. He's not saying past tense salvation, which everybody points out at. So I want to see that first and foremost. It's not... Before I get involved in faith and the faith, let's just bring out the fact that it's not a past tense salvation. Let's just bring that up first. It's an ongoing salvation. How about that? Hits you square in the eyes. Y your whole paradigm is this destroyed. So the, start with the facts. Is it in the plural tense? Present tense? Yes. So stop. Just, just understand that first, and then you got them right there. Don't forget, James is always important to know what Martin Luther called it. Martin Luther, our Reformed father, which, by the way, here's, a, here's the, another irony. Here's... You know how God's got a sense of humor? You can tell because how God does things in history. Watch this now. Uh, the, 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 the Protestant Reformation father is Martin Luther. Martin Luther is the one who said this book was sifted straw. He said, you got to throw it out. It's garbage. And he's the same guy that started the whole breakaway from the Catholic people, right? And you ask anybody who's Protestant today, you say, is Martin Luther saved? Was he saved? Oh, absolutely. He, 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 blah, 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 blah. Okay, God. Okay. So did you read his book, Jews and Their Lies? What? Yeah, there's a book he wrote, Jews and Their Lives. And it's, I'm, I, the book is disgusting because in chapters like 12 to 14, he says, if you're a Jew who believes in Jesus, I love you. But if you don't, I want to murder you and burn your house and burn your synagogue. Not nice. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Lordship Salvation person, how is he saved? He's harboring hatred. Right. How is he saved? Right. But you just said he was a Protestant Reformation father. Good luck with that conversation, Lordship Salvation person. He, in writing, shows you he's got evil stuff going on in that skull of his. And he also said purgatory is all legit. Uh, no, it's not. So he believed purgatory was still legit. Wrong. He believed you could kill a Jew if he, they weren't believing in Jesus. You could hate them and burn down a... No. You're, that's wrong. It's in the book. It, it's in writing. He's it's dead and gone for hundreds of years. It's in the book. And you, and you can just go there and go, okay, well, uh, okay, Lordship guy, explain Exhibit A. <laughs> so, um, well, he wasn't really saved. Really? So everything that came out of the Catholic Church then is all a lie then. Because he's supposed to be the Reformation father. Just saying, right? Yeah. Right? And the, and the Reforming Church got his name from that. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, what do you, yeah. it's ironic. It's God said to you, we're going, <laughs> gotcha. So it's like the guy you claim that your name after what he did is the guy that has a problem with living by faith that you say if you don't, you're not saved. Yeah. Get that through your head. <laughs> it's just like God's joke on you. He's still a godly guy. He just he had screw up problems in his life. He's a sinner. He had issues. So, yeah, so, okay. But go back to James in verse 7, chapter 2, verse 17. Yeah. Is it thus also the faith is, if it has not works, being by itself is dead. And if you get the faith, now he's getting into the, the faith issue. The faith, being by itself, is, is dead. Then you go to verse 20 and 22 in verse 20. But dost thou wish to know, O vain man, that faith, uh, the, here it goes again with the faith without works is dead. He mentions the faith in 17, the faith in 20. In verse 14, it wasn't so much the faith at the beginning. He ends up by saying the faith uh, can't save him. But he mentions about salvation's ongoing in verse 14. And then the faith is emphasized in verse 17, in verse 20. And then he completes the whole thought with verse 22. Thou seest that the faith has cooperated with his works, that the, the faith was made completed by his works, or, in other words, he got more matured, is the, is the point he's making there in verse 22, the very last word. He was matured, perfected. Look left side of your margin. The faith, it brings up the aspect of being matured. How did you get matured? Because we already saw earlier, when you ongoingly are saved, you have maturation as a following earmark of that. He starts off by saying ongoing salvation is what's needed when you have works with faith and it shows you're ongoingly being saved. So he mentions ongoing salvation. He partners it with the faith, which is the expression of action, of love. Then he culminates it with, that's what maturity is. So he's a sandwich conversation here between chapter 2, verse 14 to verse 20 about ongoing salvation, the faith, 
leads to maturity. And what's the word for was perfected? Oh, it's et etetel- Yeah, I can't even say it correctly, but it's it's uh, it's et etelion. You see that word? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what does that? It means to to maturity, unto maturity. Okay, because peace also be for maturity, right? For faith. No, peace is faith. faith. Yeah. Just faith. Oh. Just faith. Yeah. And this is tele. This is that root word for telios, which is to be perf- to be okay. completed or perfected. Okay. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. So it's just interesting how you see. And that's why I put active faith and fruit and fruit bearing is the active faith is the fruit bearing of love. On your paper, I wrote without works, not able to save ongoing. It is dead, no active, obviously. Uh, out of the works, the fruit of love, and then the faith is made. Uh, there's your etilio. I put it right there in your paper there. Until the complete, matured, perfect. The audience is brethren. Verse chapter one, verse two. He warns them not to be double souled Chapter one, verse eight. But take in the implanted word, and 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 again we saw that from yesterday. That is sown only to those in Christ. And the Luke eight passage is the sower, and the seed passage of Luke's uh, word of God, the, the the word of God being sown, which is able to save their souls, as we saw yesterday, chapter one, verse twenty one, twenty four, and then First Peter one nine. So all of James is taken out of context by people when they don't understand what's being spoken of. And then you go back, after you explain those verses, then you go back to verse 1 of the very first part of the book. And he's talking, or verse 2, I should say. He says, brethren, well, these are folks that aren't saved. No, no, these are folks that are saved. <laughs> and then he goes into even talking about don't be double souls. And he mentions about saving the soul. So the issue is about your life being lived. Are you living up to the level of ongoing salvations? And the evidence is your lack of love. And if you have love, though, then you'll be ongoingly mature. Because that's an evidence. Your ongoing salvation is evidence in, in your ongoing works, which is evidenced for, first and foremost by your love. And that love leads to your ongoing maturation process as you hold on strivingly, tirelessly to work out this salvation. That's what he's talking about. And by the way, who wrote James? The half-brother of Jesus, the, the, the son of Mary, who was raised in the home with Jesus all his life, and he knew doggone well, he screwed it up. He could have easily aligned himself with him, been an encourager to his brother, loved on his brother, and been like behind his brother. Yeah, man, I know who you are. I know I'm with you, man. I'm with you, man. But he didn't do that. He got, he got like, you know, he knew who he was, but he just did the whole brother family thing and didn't want to support him. And then he realizes after he rose again from the dead, because scripture says family didn't follow him, but after he rose from the dead, he's like, dog, got it. I knew who he was, and he's looking back at all that life he wasted. Like, what an idiotic move that was to not be endearing to him and close to him and loving to him and following him and supporting him and encouraging him. Not that he needed all that. He's God. But the fact that he missed out on that as a brother of our Lord, and all of us would have died to have been there. Are you kidding me? I would exchange places in a minute. I get raised up with him as my older brother, as my, as my peeps. He's my older brother I can look up to. Not just that, but he's my God, my Savior, my Messiah. Yeah. Sign me up. I mean, but there's no outhouse, there's no electricity, no AC. I don't care. I get that. That's good. I mean, so, but he, he looked back and he's saying, gosh, I, I could have, would have, should have done more. And that's why he's talking this way. And he realized that what he could have, should have, would have done better. Believing in Jesus, but not supporting him and actively engaging in his relationship with him as his brother. He was a distant, far off from him. And that, that's why he's writing this. People don't even see that. Would you please see that for crying out loud? Don't ignore the elephant in the room. Who is writing it matters. I mean, what he saw was different. I yeah. remember Luther said that the epistle of James was an epistle of straw. He yeah, sifted straw. Tr- yeah, no, sifted straw. Really? Yeah, he called it sifted straw. And so that's why I don't forget the six books of the Bible that we talk about. Remember, that this is something you should know. So the six books of the Bible that, remember, are the last ones to be entered into the canonization. Do you know what they are? You should know this by heart. No. I do. Mm. So the six books of the Bible that were entered last into the scripture, meaning everybody said, oh, these books, these 27 books are all good. No, these, these 19 books are all good. They were like, we're good, these 19. They're like, eh, there's six more we think we should include. <laughs> yeah, we're debating those ones. We're not really sure about that. I'll show you 21. I said 27. Yeah. 21 books. There's six more left over to get 27. There's 21 books we're good on, but there's actually six. I, I don't know. And why was that? What do these books have in common? Think about it. Ready? Book of James, Revelation. I that. Hebrews, 1st, 2nd Peter, I said that already, 1st, 2nd Peter, book of James, Hebrews, Revelation, and Jude. Yeah. Those are the six. So those six books, they were the last ones, I'll say it again, so I'll write them on the board if you want. So you got, again, you got James, Jude, Revelation, 1st, 2nd Peter, and Revelation. What's that? Hebrews. 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 Yeah, Hebrews, Revelation, James, Jude, 1st, 2nd Peter. Oh, was I say James all? Uh, the first book written? No. I have that written down here, first book written. I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. No, it's Job. Oh, James is the first book written. Was it the first book written? 
James. Was it James? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, bro. I can't remember offhand. Thank you. And it was, I must, I must and it was that before. canonized. Yeah, one of the, last the last ones written, yeah. And, and the, they, what do those books have in common? What do those six books have in common? Think about it. They all have in common. Uh, uh, no, no. no. They, all, they all have in common uh, an accountability oh, okay. for the people in Christ. All of them have a mentioning. Hebrew has warnings. Hebrews has warnings. Mm -hmm. James says this faith can't yeah, save you. Right. right? Revelation is down and heavy with Jesus being presented as the, the throwdown king. Uh, that ain't funny at all. And then you have first, second Peter is like, wow, about uh, having to end of your salvation, your soul salvation. The, the, the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord, day of God. And then Jude talks about saving those out of the fire. I mean, goodness gracious. So there's all these different kinds of things. They're all like heavy handed in their message. I was but, thinking James with such his emphasis on works, possibly because he's looking back on the decades that he didn't have works and he's wanting to really go for it now. Well, because he, he's looking at because his relationship with Jesus he missed out on as his brother. Yeah. But, and so the works weren't there. Yeah, no. He, well, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's looking to really, yeah, he's looking to really well, apply himself. He didn't have himself. dwelling then anyway, but. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, he could have done, he could have, would have, should have done better. Yeah. Can I explain about the double-minded or double -sided? Yeah, so double, that's in verse 8. So in verse 8, when you see that in verse 8, when he says, a man of two souls, look at him. I have this in my Bible. It's always to remind me. This, this, little, this little picture here in my, my Bible is to remind me. The book of James is where I first realized that, that I, the whole, this is an old thing when I was younger in the faith. I remember this is a conversation we had about these guys in the First Baptist Church Orlando. I'm not sure if Lee, you were a part of this. I can't remember for sure, but I think you might have been. But remember that this whole conversation where we talked about how could Jesus be tempted? Was oh, he tempted yeah. with a chance yeah. to sin or not? But you were part of that, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we kept uh, we were yeah. going as young people in the faith, but like one year in going, was he tempted so he could sin? Or yeah. I'm like, uh, and I was like, um, that don't sound right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So some were like, yeah, he could sin. I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. That's not even doesn't even sound right. It was a non passing non Bukhari yeah. theory. <laughs> yeah, so that was a long time. So, yeah, so this little thing in my, my Bible reminds me of, of the, what the word trial and I mentioned before to you guys. So when God gives you a trial, it's to bring out what he's deposited into us, to bring out a righteous action. That same word for trial can be used as a temptation when we give into our flesh. And now Satan goes, <laughs> now you're tapping into your sin, and now a sin comes out. Your, your desires of your own or desires come out into sin. So it's the same word. That's why when Satan tempted Jesus, the, should, the word should be saying that Satan put Jesus through a trial. So it shouldn't say the last temptation of Christ. It should say the last trial of Christ or the or the trial of Christ. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a temptation. There's nothing to tempt him. He's holy and pure and divine. You can't tempt him with money and greed and all that stuff. He's like, so? He's like, I'm God. There's nothing in me that desires any of that. <laughs> There's nothing in me. So, so, but, so in verse 8, this is what's going on with these people. These men of two souls, it, it, in the word there is dia sukos, which is, means double soul. So it's suke with dia, double soul. So in verse eight, it's a, a double soul. Bless you, a double soul is unstable in all his ways. And and that word again, un, unstable means he's un, unrestrained. He's he's just unsteady. So he's either unsteady this way or unrestrained. He, just, he doesn't have any inhibitors that allow him to just check down with what's right and wrong. He just goes willy nilly on whatever floats his boat. You know. So this person, like, there's things that ground me and, and you. I would hope all of us. There's things that you don't say or don't do. No conscious, no. Yeah, like no conscious. He just kind of just goes willy nilly on whatever. I mean, there's things. I mean, I tell you, like I touched mentioning even in the Bible study, even much more of a lighter issue. I still restrain myself in some way because I just want to really go out on people, and I, I can't do that, but I want to. <laughs> so, but this guy has no restraint at all. He's like, there's nothing stabilizes him. What stabilizes me is knowing I'm accountable. That that I, I should I should do better for for how God's loved me. I should love others, and there's all those memories in my life about. I mean, come on, I've come too far to turn back now and all those kind of things. But these people, don't, they have no consideration. No consideration at all for what God's done for them, who they are, what their future holds. They just simply do whatever they feel is within their best interest. And that's, what you're, that's why you're unstable. That's why you're unrestrained. You just do whatever. And it kind of reminds me of a guy that has you know, one leg in one side of the fence and one leg in the other. You know? I remember like the guy, I remember when we first learned about the kingdom things. And this reminds me of a guy, I won't say his full name, but his first name was Roy. And Noah's last name was not Firestone, but his first name was Roy. <laughs> and, and he was a Freemason in the congregation. And I didn't know what that was. And I learned real quickly what that was. Um, well, I knew what that was. Excuse me. This is after. I didn't know what that was at first. I, so I'll go back. It was the first guy that was named Don. He's the guy I first met that was a Freemason. 
at First Baptist. I didn't know what that was. I learned through him what that was. And I was like, well, wait a second. You believe Satan is God, and that's a no. And so, oh, no, we don't. He's tried to convince me. Older guy, gray hair. He's, he's definitely dead by now. He was like an 80-year-old guy at the time. This was like 20 years ago. And he was trying to convince me. He was on the board of the deacons, board of the elders. I went to the associate pastor guy. I said, why don't you teach on Freemasonry? And he said, because I can't. And that's when we had this conversation, me and this guy. They asked him to go come to me and tell me why. I'm like, oh, boy, I'm in trouble. So he started coming to me. all the Every week was like pamphlets, you know, and conversations. So eventually I'm like, I, I read your stuff. It was all his slant. I said, no. Well, this other guy later on, I, I, I didn't like that. But that was how it ended. There was no resolve. It was just like he just presented his information and said, you didn't. That's not true. This is what the real truth is. He had this narrative. It's kind of like Joe Witnesses. If you go on their site, they have a narrative that they say they're Christians, by the way. They, they say that. It's not true, but they keep saying it. Like Freemasons say, we're just a fraternity. Okay, yeah, right, sure. Then why do you take vows to slit your throat and, and your entrails that are similar to the, to the Mormons, almost exactly identical? What's with the secrecy stuff? And why are you putting the Book of Quran on the same level playing field as the Bible on an altar? That, that, that's, not, that's not a fraternity. You're involving God, so that's no longer a fraternity at that point. And you're putting the Bible on the same even playing field as the Quran. So anyway, so then I went to Chattanooga, learned about kingdom things. And this guy named Roy learned he was a Freemason. And that's when I was like, what the heck? I mean, I expected that from lower level, but not. Come on, are you serious? And there's one dude in the whole place. There's one guy. It's the one. Everybody else was fine. Everybody else was like, yeah, we know, but you mean but. You shouldn't, that should be said. So I, I, I mentioned, he didn't like that at all. Especially being young like I was. I was only like, I don't know, 20 something or 30. 20, I was like 20 something, I say, 20, 21, 22. It's 30 years ago. And so I say, so he's, he's like 60 something, it's like twice my age. So I'm like, well, I don't care if you're six times my age, you're still wrong. So in front of the pulpit, I said, because they gave me a chance to talk and I, and I said it. So, and so, yeah, he didn't like that. He, he stormed out and walked away. And then the pastor guy, Jonathan, that was, you think I'm talking fast and rough now. That's way bad. Really? Like yeah, and also very like, you know, very like on un, hold, like no hold oh, bar kind of thing. No and I, and I kind of came real like emotional and stuff. And, and so he kind of walked out, not kind of, he got up and walked out. And the pastor guy um, told me, you got to just relax, man. And I go, no, you should relax on the, you, I can't, but why do you have him on your staff? You shouldn't even have him here without yeah. hearing what he's doing is wrong. So finally, he did remove him from the staff. But, he, and that, but he, he said, I agree with you on that, but I'm not going to tell him to not come. I said, I'm not saying that. I'm saying he should just know that it's wrong. That's all I'm saying. You, you can't prevent senators from coming in. If they, they, don't, if they don't know it's true, that's good. I'm just saying they can't be okay with the fact that they're sinning and you're saying it's okay. That's what I don't like. So if you're a recovering prostitute, I'm not going to say, oh, see, man, still, you're good, you're good. No, I'm going to say that's wrong. I still love you, but it's wrong. If you're a recovering cocaine person, don't bring your crack in the house. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you can't just... So, he did, he did that. He, he took him off the board, but he still came. And, and, but he and I, at that point, Roy, never talked to me ever again. Like, okay. That's probably good. Yeah, but I'm like, he never changed, though. He never changed. He never left the Freemason thing, like ever. Okay, but, but, the rule, but the rule was he could no longer mention it any time ever in the grounds or on the parking lot everywhere to anybody ever again because he was inviting people to come and all that stuff. To Freemason Lodge this or this, the... The feeding of that or the whatever. And he said, the pastor, I said, no, you can't allow him to do that at all. You can't change who he is. That's him. That's him and God. But you certainly can restrain the solicitation of ignorance, that this is wrong. So he, he stopped doing all that. So I was kind of interesting. So John's the same guy, the same guy when Jim went to visit there. They had bigotry too. Remember that? Yeah. Jim knows the truth. He was there. And Jim walked in. This other dude walked out. Well, I was ticked about that too. So, so John was an old Southern Baptist kind of mentality. He was this old like KFC guy, looked like the bolo type. Remember that? Look, the yeah, KFC the guy come to life off, off the bucket. Yeah. Looked just like that dude. Colonel. Right off the bucket. <laughs> right off the bucket. Yeah, look, didn't, look, didn't he though? Didn't he, Jim? Look, just, yeah. Yeah. He looked just like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, right, right. But he was through. But it just shows you the people with kingdom of thinking it doesn't mean that they're like you know without ignorant thoughts in their minds. It just it just, it just shocked me. I didn't know that even exi could exist. So it's like God early on gave me that example of whether it's doctrinally with the Freemasonry or with bigotry of people. Either way, it's like it was present and alive and well and the people are supposed to be maturing in their faith. How can this be? Are you guys this stupid? I mean, I don't understand it. I was like, it's just, I'm like, I'm 20 something years old and you're like 60 and you're, you're still this dumb? You had 40 more years on me and you're still this dumb? I'm like, how do you, how do you get this dumb? I mean, do you eat feces? I mean, 
So I, I just didn't even understand it. But I remember John corrected that too, by the way. And then that guy, I forget his name. I think his name was Glenn at the time. He actually. Glenn at the time. Is it different? No. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I, I know. At the time, at that time, Glenn. I remember calling him out too from the pulpit. But he ended up, I don't think, ever coming back. I think he did leave. Oh, here. Yeah. But it just kind of reminds me of this whole faith without work yeah. stuff and people misunderstand. They were living two lives, that's my point. This guy's living a life of hating on people for the color of their skin, and no one knew it until Jim walks in the door at a Bible at a breakfast for men, and all of a sudden it was exposed. And I'm like, oh, hell no. Because this guy walked right out. And he goes, let's continue. No, let's not continue. Let's address what just happened. That, that ain't happening. You know, no. No, until he addressed it. Like the other guy, the Freemason, the same thing. They, they're living two lives. He's over there on these twice a week going to this organization of men saying the Bible and the Quran is the same, and we're all brothers in Christ. When you're doing this darkness stuff on the other side, now can that that's be double soul? Of double soul. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. That's why I'm bringing all this up. It, they're double soul. They're embracing darkness over here, but living as if there are no that's kingdom kind of things over here. Just, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Same with that guy who's like, well, I know kingdom things, but I'm harboring hatred toward folks because of the color of their skin. Or I'm not going to name, name any names or anything, but there's another guy who was a definitive bigotry person and a misogynist. And and to define that, misogynist meaning looks at women like they have no role whatsoever. That of importance equal to a man, and that is disgusting. The, the only reason that women are, in, are are an inferior role, if you will, or in a subordinate role is more appropriate to say. Bible does say inferior. I get that, but it means in a subordinate role to the man is because of a sinful situation, not because you're less. That is never the case. It's because of God's order of things. That's all. That's it. It's totally equal in every single way of a man. It's just God's order of things says man then woman. Okay, so. But this this guy I won't name his name Gary. He said that he was you know a misogynist. <laughs> he was a misogynist. I that. <laughs> a misogynist. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. And by the way, there was a comment made. There was a comment made that he he was he would really? say things to me constantly that were just so I can't repeat because it was just off color off yes. color. So that's not good. So but that this kind of shows again the whole point of being double soul. You could you could be a kingdom person teaching believing. The whole point is, and this brand up to show you how you could have your foot in that side of the world, whether it's in engaging in worldly things or thinking and harboring thoughts that are just not of pleasing to God. How could you think that misogyny, bigotry, discrimination, harboring your your fellowship with darkness is okay with God? How how do you how do you justify that? But in some way, in James one eight, he tells you they were doing it. They were doing it. It's nothing new under the sun. Solomon says they were doing it then. We're doing it now. Nothing's new. So. But that's why you have to have ongoing salvation. So there you have this other aspect here is traits of the Son of God. Uh, on back to your paper here, and that means you're born out of God. I have a born out of God, and then you also have the uh, invited to the wedding feast. So go to First John in chapter three. First John in chapter three. We're in this 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 uh, part of the syllabus about looking at things in regards to how we are again different in how we see things in Scripture. And let me know if you guys are ready to take a break at all. It's, it's just past 12, just so you know. Is this a new section, then? Not yet. Oh. We're in, we're, uh, we got, we got one more, we got two more pages left, front and back, before we go to our last uh, oh, subsection. Wow. Purple, yeah. So, so in the, fir, in the traits of God, 1 John 3, 2, so in 1 John 3, 2, he said, Beloved, now are we the children of God. So I'm reading from your, from your paper. So, Beloved, now we are the sons of God. Those who are deemed worthy through obedience unto fruit yield to obtain, which is to hit the mark, the tashin of the age and the messianic reign, and of the resurrection out of dead ones, which are those eknekron raised from those raised to heaven. They are sons of God and sons of the resurrection, which I pointed out from Luke. And it says, does it appear what we will be, we shall know when we appear, we'll be like him, for we see him as he is. Now many folks think talks everybody in Christ, right? Because the way it's worded. Oh, it's everybody in Christ. No, he, he's qualifying these people by telling you that we should be like him for see him as he is. And again, if you look at these things, go back to uh, Luke chapter 20. So I, I referenced that for a reason, because in Luke 20, he qualifies who gets to partake in a resurrection that is worthy. I didn't say that. Jesus said that in Luke chapter 20. And he mentions this in Luke 20. And verse, I put it on the paper, verse 35 and 36. He says, but those deemed worthy to obtain the age, obtain, those deemed worthy and to obtain the age. Again, that means to ongoing inheritance, ongoing half of us as a possession. Those deemed worthy, not all buddy in Christ, those deemed worthy, Luke 20, 35, to obtain the age 
and that resurrection, anastasis, that from the dead neither are married nor given in marriage, for they can die no more because they are like angels and are sons of God, sons of the resurrection, which means he's telling you that you have a, it's a qualifying comment. It's a qualifying description. It's a qualifying title. You're not a son of God because you believe in Jesus. You have to ongoingly live in obedience to him and be deemed worthy of that. So son of God is kind of like akin to the book of life. You can be written down now as son of God because you're in obedience to him. But you're about to find out that you fulfill that or did you back away from it. That'll, re that'll either retain your position as such or you get erased as such. So that, that's what that is. So you have to just understand that's, that's what he's talking about in 1 John 3, 2. Then in 1 John 5, 4, go back to 1 John again in 5, 4, there's another interesting comment he makes that people, again, misunderstand, and they apply it to everybody in Jesus, but it's not true. In 1 John 5, 4, they just don't understand. He says, because, we did this book study before, but just to remind us, it says, because all the, that has begotten, is where you get that whole out of God comment I made earlier in the, in the paper, because all that have been begotten by God, look at the left side of your margin, because all that have been out, out of the God, right, overcome. So that's where he's talking, all that have been begotten continuously, as the continual begotten, born out of God, among those already in Christ, continue believe, is that's the verse, that's back to verse one, the continue believe, and then in John 3, 16, he mentions that, John 5, 24, he says, you don't come into judgment, those who continually believe will have life for the age. So again, continual belief, ongoing tenses are ignored in King James. They're ignored in NIV. They're ignored in theology teachers. I don't know why they do it. I think they must know. You can't tell me they don't know. So it'll be a definition for continually believe. To believe in, to, good, good question. So continue to believe equals trusting in Jesus as your savior, as God Almighty, right. and, and his word, trusting what he says is true. That's continuing to believe. Not just in him, but what his word has to say. That's how you show continued belief. You just can't say, I still believe Jesus then and now. 20 years later, he's still my Savior. I continue to believe. No, no, no. Do you believe in his word? So when you, it's him, the living word, and the written word. You have to have them both. That's why, the, remember the Mark 9, 24 guy, the father with the demonic son, when Jesus healed him, he said, I believe. Help me in my belief. Meaning, I believe you're the Messiah. Help me believe what you just did. I, I can't even fathom what just happened. Was just, he, he was possessed with demons. He just made, oh, and now he's a whole mind again. Like, what's up? Here goes Lee laughing. So, I mean, it's just an amazing thing. It's like to believe in God's word ongoing means that you have to subject yourself to the changing theology, the subjection to being humbled and saying, you know, I was wrong. I mean, like what I mentioned the other day about me learning about Hades. Uh, anything that you have to just see in God's word, don't try to force it. Just be willing to say, I... I like right here, when I showed this guy, for example, this guy at work, I showed this verse to in the Greek language. And he goes, out of God. And I go, he goes, what is that supposed to mean? And I go, well, it doesn't mean what it says in English, though. Let's start with that. And he goes, no, it doesn't. And I said, so do you see it's different, right? And he goes, yeah. I don't know what it means, though. And I go, it's okay. But do you, but you agree that it that, that, that does change the way you're thinking about it, doesn't it? And he goes, yeah. That's people that already know what Jesus is. And now you're saying there's something else that happens. I go, exactly. So that's, he's ongoingly believing. He doesn't know what it means, but he's ongoingly believing. He's been showing God's, God's word, the truth of it, and he's going, I believe it. Help me understand what it's saying. But he, he wants to subject himself to ongoingly learn from God's word. Even though he doesn't know, he's still willing to learn. That's what ongoing believing is. It doesn't mean you know it all. It just means that you believe in Christ, and you're ongoingly trusting whether you know it or not. His word is absolute truth. If it changes your theology, rattles your cage, and you have to tear down your own wineskin, then so be it. You just, you just do it. What's that? The Ethiopian eunuch. Yeah. He says, "Well, now, best of being baptized, yeah." <laughs> I think it's hard to to make those changes going deeper in your faith. That was so hard for me when I first came here because I thought that I was going against my original teaching theology. What in my heart, I'm I'm, I'm going against God and everything. I learned His Word is just wrong. It was weird. wrong teaching. So it made a difference for you say that, that. So you're saying for you, mm -hmm. you felt you were betraying. Correct. So what made the difference? What made you, what was the difference in changing? 